Hi, everybody. Welcome to the QB School. I'm JT O'Sullivan. Today, Q&A. Got all sorts of good questions here. Going to talk personnel. Going to talk wide receiver. Going to talk wide receiver releases. Going to talk quarterback sacks. This will be a good one. All sorts of information. Hopefully, you enjoy it. Welcome to the QB School. All right. First question, Maurice. Hi, JT. Love what you are doing. Nice to see in this video. I'm not the only guy from the Netherlands watching your content. I appreciate the global impact, y'all. My question is, I hear regularly people speak of 11 or 12 personnel. What is that? Doesn't sound logical to me. The 12, that is. Great question. Uh, I remember having the exact same question actually playing football. I want to say it was in college where normally you'll hear defenses talk about personnel in this regard. It's actually kind of kind of law kind of carried over in my life where now I talk about both sides of the ball being in double digit personnel or digit personnel is how I like to refer to it. But it's pretty common football language. So it's a great thing to better understand. And to be honest with you, I still have to think about it, kind of what it means every single time I say it, just because it's not kind of like my first language of how I think about personnel. But the essence of it is, is to think that the first digit that you hear is the number of running backs. The second digit is the number of tight ends. So say, for instance, we're in or you're in 21 personnel. That would mean that there are two running backs on the field, one tight end. And then they don't say the wide receiver numbers because that's just inferred. If, they're, if you're in 21 personnel, that there's two wide receivers. So there's always going to be five. And so oftentimes you'll see 11 personnel. That would be one running back, one tight end, three wide receivers. Or you could be in 12 personnel, one running back, two tight ends, two wide receivers. And those are kind of the most common ones. I think oftentimes nowadays you'll see 10 a lot in college and high school with kind of no tight ends, four wide receivers, one running back. You'll occasionally see every type of personnel. You'll see zero personnel where it's five wide receivers. You can see, you know, 23 personnel at the goal line, two running backs, three tight ends. But even then, I still have to think about it. It's not my first way that I say it. I think offensive people usually think those personnel groups are given names or tags. So it's either base personnel zebra is usually 11 in west coast world tiger is 12 personnel west coast world but defensively most defenses refer to personnel groups by those double digit numbers just because it's a really easy way to kind of say who's on the field and now that i point that out to you you'll probably realize you'll see it on the sidelines a lot like like this photo for instance it's just a quick way for the defense to kind of glance over to the sideline and be like okay 12's on the field and those numbers can quickly change. And so oftentimes, defensively, there's someone in the booth up in the up high up in the stadium. So now that I point that out, you'll realize that there's oftentimes coaches way up in the booth, binoculars, you'll see them in the back row when they show those coaches booths. And they're just eyeballing, trying to see the substitutions on the sideline to see what personnel group is coming in. So then they might get down to the sideline and then they can kind of play telephone out to the players on the field saying, okay, this is 12 personnel or this is 21 or this is 11 personnel. And then all the players then know what they want to run or how they want to align to those personnel groups or tendencies. You know, most teams will probably run it a lot more out of 12 personnel or 21 personnel, and they'll do a lot of play action where a lot of teams in 11 personnel, that's usually your third down, you know, where you want to get three wide receivers out on the field, you're going to probably drop back and throw it more. But there's can be all sorts of little cues and tips from scouting an opponent to know what they want to do in different situations and different personnel groups. So that's why you want to know what the personnel is, especially if you play defense. And then offensively, personnel groups, it's another way to get a bunch of different players in the game. So instead of only having five guys who can touch the ball and play those positions, you know, if you have a bunch of tight ends, then you want to run 12 or 13. You know, so if you have a bunch of wide receivers, you want to be in 10 or 0 or 11. And so it's a way to manipulate the matchups into your favor. And it's just a really easy way once you understand it. First digit running back, second digit tight end, the third digit, the wide receiver is not said. So it's just a real simple way to kind of communicate what personnel group is on the field. It's a great question. And hopefully I hope it helps you enjoy football a little bit more and be able to see it now when you recognize it on the field. All right, next question. I know it's probably a little different for every offense, but what is the difference between a Z and X wide receiver positions? It's a great question, and it is different for every offense. But normally, you want to think that the X receiver or the split end is usually on the line of scrimmage. 
and the Z receiver or the flanker is usually on the opposite side, usually on the right, that the X is usually on the left. On the line of scrimmage, the Z is usually on the right and off the line of scrimmage as the flanker. So Z off the line of scrimmage, X on the line of scrimmage. Now they can certainly flip flop and can be on the same side all the time, but in most base kind of right formations, the Z is gonna be the outside wide receiver to the right off the line of scrimmage, usually tethered to the tight end who will be on the line of scrimmage. And then on the opposite side of the ball, the X wide receiver is usually the outside wide receiver on the line of scrimmage. And that's really the only kind of things that's almost borderline universal. I know some teams don't call them X and Z receivers. You know, you get into air raid systems, they call them left and right, and they stay on that side of the ball. So there are different ways to talk about it, but the most common kind of baseline understanding, X wide receiver split end on the line of scrimmage, Z wide receiver flanker off the line of scrimmage. So that's the person that usually goes in motion. You see flanker short, Z short, all these Z motion, zoom motion, zip motion, any of these Z words because the Z is off the line of scrimmage and there it's a lot easier to move them in motion. Not that the X wide receiver can't step off, but when someone steps off, someone has to step on and it's this big process. But the easiest way to think about it for me is X wide receiver split end on the line of scrimmage, Z wide receiver flanker off the line of scrimmage, kind of the universal way to think about it. But great question. Hope that helps. Next question, Jamie. JT love the vids. Are there any universal automatic audibles that quarterbacks do when they get to the line of scrimmage? Jamie, not really. I mean, there are some that probably carry over to many offenses. Uh, it's probably more just the system that you're in. So for instance, uh, West Coast world, back in the day, the normal, the, the easiest thing that you used to hear all the time was read over. And that audible was in the run game. And basically all that meant is if we're running to the left, and we don't like what we have over there for whatever reason, instead of saying uh, color number cadence, so instead of saying green 18, green 18, set hut, you would say red over, red over, set hut, and it would just be the same play set the other way. And you used to see quarterbacks kind of hit their hips a little bit. So it would tell the running back, we're going the other way, same play, other way, red over. Other ones that are pretty common are alerts and kills. Different teams do different things where they can call two plays in the huddle. You'd call one play, alert the second play. You walk up to the line of scrimmage, either alert, alert, point at your head or point up, I've seen, and it basically just alerts that second play. Everybody knows what the second play is. You can do the same function with a kill, usually through the neck. So kill, 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 things like that. I think the only thing that probably is universal and and I, I, I'm, I'm almost positive it goes across many levels too, even of peewee football is kind of the goose uh, center quarterback exchange. So you'd walk up, all of a sudden, there's nobody in the two A gaps. You're playing quarterback under center. It really only works under center. You come up and you basically tap the behind of the center. He knows, snap it right away, and quick quarterback sneak. Goose in the center is probably the only universal, universal thing you could do walking in off the street kind of to, and everyone would understand who's part of the process. Centers, quarterbacks would know that that's kind of an option to be able to goose the center, but it's pretty rare nowadays, especially with all these quarterbacks getting hurt and quarterback sneaks. But again, you see it every once in a while, but as far as universally, you know, beyond just kind of the alert, the kill, the red over stuff a long time ago, I don't think very many teams do the red over stuff as much anymore, but the goose under center is probably the only thing that's a universal kind of audible that you'd be able to go into any team do and the quarterback and center would be able to know right out the gate. So great question. Blazo, JT, can you tell us your experience on how to fall safely when you are sacked? Did you practice at any time? Thanks for the great content you share. Best regards from Serbia. Love it. Uh, getting sacked. Practicing getting sacked, you know, probably not really. I think it's one of those things you learn pretty quickly that you would prefer to fall on your non-throwing shoulder. But, you know, sometimes the circumstances don't allow you to pick those type of things. I think the other thing that you learn pretty quickly is not to fall with your hands out. You know, and I, not something that you necessarily practice, but I ended up kind of getting my thumb jacked with a little bit a handful of times and so you learn pretty quickly to kind of fall and roll or protect yourself as best as you can i think the one thing that people really don't understand how much you practice and it depends on what what your background is but for many quarterbacks who play baseball sliding is not a thing like it's pretty easy to do if you know how to slide but i'm still to the point where i remember practicing at many different places in the nfl and to compound that, many quarterbacks didn't play baseball, so they don't know how to slide. So all of a sudden, you're asking a guy to do something at full speed in a really violent environment that they're not comfortable doing. And so 
that ability to practice sliding or even just knowing how to kind of get down and protect yourself, even if you want to go head first, you know, it's one of those things that definitely gets practiced and probably should be practiced more, to be honest with you. Sliding is something that kind of protects your career, protects your team. All these things are so important to be able to have the capacity to do. The other thing that I've seen kind of hurt people with sliding is the knee brace thing. Oftentimes you all of a sudden won't realize that, you know, you're playing with a, with a quarterback who has a knee brace. Now sliding is a real issue. So just kind of finding ways to protect yourself as best you can. But as far as practicing falling, probably not practicing more, just kind of awareness, how to slide, especially protecting yourself on the boundary, seeing a bunch of quarterbacks get hurt, kind of slowing down right when they get to the to the uh, sideline. I think many of us can think of like Drew uh, Bledsoe, but there are many more instances where people get hurt on the sidelines because they'll slow down and the defender is not slowing down. So we always talk about running through the white and protecting yourself on the sideline. But great question. Absolutely need to protect yourself as best as possible. Unfortunately, there's just no good way to practice it other than to be aware of it and to protect yourself when you can. All right, last question. The Lens Man. Can you break down a wide receiver release? What is a good release and what isn't? So this is a great question, and this is totally subjective. So you will be, you could be at any offense with any wide receiver coach, coordinator, head coach, and they would probably tell you a little bit something different. I think the essence of it is, is I don't really care as long as they go really fast and are open. So what I mean by that is, you know, we can sit here and, you know, you can do ladder drills and talk about different type of press releases that you're going to face, what you need to do to rip through someone or whatever, like, I don't care what you do as long as you go really fast and get off the line of scrimmage. My issue with wide receivers is when they jack with the timing of a route because they're dancing at the line of scrimmage and the DB is just kind of standing there threatening to bump them but not really engaging them, especially two-hand or one-hand bump. And so I prefer personally for wide receivers to get off the line of scrimmage as quickly as possible, to dance at a minimum and get vertical as quickly as possible and really threaten that DB because if they're in bump, you know that they're nervous about getting blown by or run by. So you want to threaten them vertically as quickly as possible. So my favorite type of releases are fast. Now, can you be fast and get blown out to the sideline if the guy touches you? Yeah, you need to have some coordination, some timing, some rhythm to be able to set someone up and get off the line of scrimmage. And in reality, you just want someone to win, not get jacked at the line of scrimmage. Because if you get jacked, you're not good to anybody. You know, if they hold you at the line of scrimmage with a good bump, you got no chance. But again... If there's a perfect world, we want you to get as vertical as quickly as you can and threaten that DB so that they feel the pressure of, oh, I got to get out of there as opposed to being able to sit in there and bench press you at the line of scrimmage. So there's no good way to do it. I know some teams teach certain techniques on certain routes. I like to give freedom to be able to kind of creative to get out there, get open, do what you need to do, but understand the timing and kind of urgency at the line of scrimmage as opposed to dancing around or giving me this like, you know, head bob thing. Just go, bro. Go as fast as you can. Get open and we'll go from there. So great question. All right. That's a wrap. Hopefully you enjoyed the Q&A. It was fun getting into it. Love the questions. Keep them coming. Hopefully it helps you get a better understanding of a little bit of ball. If you have any more, hit me with those questions. Keep them coming. It's a lot more fun for me to do it with thoughtful, meaningful questions that people are going to get something from. I really appreciate it. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button. I appreciate all the support of the channel. Have a great one. See you next time.